Kia ora koto katoa. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, it's been suggested we start with a quote, so I've got a quote here. For too long, the history taught in our New Zealand schools has simply reflected a colonising interpretation. Uh, my name's Susan Healy, I'm the chair for today, and I've got a few details to go through with you first of all. Uh, can you be sure that you're on the right webinar? The title is Owning Our History, The New Zealand Wars. And to let you know that you can participate, if you follow down uh, through the Zoom at the bottom, there is a place for question and answer and also for chatting. So you can use those facilities. There is a moderator on hand who will help in terms of transmitting those questions for me, which will happen in the latter part of the session. As I've said, our topic is owning our history, the New Zealand wars. And I'd like to introduce our presenters. First of all, Vincent O'Malley, who is a founding part of History Works, a group of historians specialising in Treaty of Waitangi research. His landmark book on the Waikato War, The Great War for New Zealand Waikato, 1800 to 2000. And most recently, his best-selling book, The New Zealand Wars, Na Pukanga or Aotearoa. He has a very key role in the Marsden Fund supported project, He Tonga Te Wariwari remembering and forgetting difficult histories in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Most importantly, this project moves well beyond simply revisiting colonial accounts of these wars. A vital part of the project involves how tribal memories are passed to younger generations. And this will be pursued by Joanna Kipman, who is our co-presenter this morning. Joanna is of Ngāti Mania Photo, Ngāti Rokawa. She's a sociologist who works with Māori youth living in precarious economic circumstances in a wide range of urban, municipal and rural settings. She is particularly interested in working alongside Māori communities that are actively rebuilding tribal futures for Tai Ohi Māori. Her main focus has been the ongoing impact of colonialism and associated state policies and practices linked to income poverty, high incarceration rates and poor education, and the impact of institutional and systemic racism on Māori. So it's with, it is a real honour to have the both of you presenting this morning. Kia ora to you both. Kia ora. So I'm going to open by putting an opening question to you. Can you start by explaining to anyone watching today and who doesn't, who, who doesn't know about this, what the New Zealand wars were? Uh, kia ora Susan, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you everybody for joining us um, in these troubled times. And um, it's a great privilege to be invited to take part in this series of webinars. Uh, the future of public speaking in New Zealand, at least for the next few months anyway. Um, so what were the New Zealand wars? These were a series of conflicts fought between the Crown and various groups of Māori between 1845 uh, and 1872. Um, they left 6,000 people killed or wounded, two thirds of them Māori. Um, and they also brought 18,000 British troops to New Zealand. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale of that, in 1858, the Pākehā population of New Zealand was about uh, just under 60,000. So if you can imagine, you've got 18,000 British troops. The country was almost under military occupation. This was a massive event, not just in New Zealand history, but in wider British imperial history. Um, and a lot of those soldiers remained behind. Um, so a lot of New Zealanders today, Māori and Pākehā, would have ancestors who were involved or caught up in these wars in some ways. Um, and why were they so important? I would argue that these wars really went to what the country was and what it could become. And at heart, this came down to, to 
two competing understandings of what the Treaty of Waitangi that had been signed in 1840 was all about. On the one hand, the Crown expected to be in charge and they assumed that they'd acquired full sovereignty over the country. And that accorded with British settler expectations, the uh, Victorian racial hierarchy that placed them at the top of that apex, uh, that, that ama imagined apex. Um, and they regarded Maori as inferior. And a lot of these settlers arrived in New Zealand after 1840. They discovered outside, you know, townships like Auckland and Wellington and so on, Maori are basically running the, running the country, they're dominating the economy. That's incredibly powerful. So the signing of the treaty itself in 1840 didn't really change much on the ground um, in most of the country. And it's really only in the main sequence of New Zealand wars in the 1860s, between 1860 and 1872, that you get this contest between these two different ideas of what the treaty was about. On the one hand, these crown ideas of we're in charge. On the other hand, Māori, that's not what Māori has signed up to in Te Tiriti. Um, that being promised Rangatira Tanga over their own affairs, and the Crown was ceded to one thing, governance, which is much, much less than sovereignty over the country. So it's kind of this, you know, is this about, is this relationship going to be about partnership and mutual prosperity for all? That, that's the way that Māori envisions it. On the other hand, these Pākehā are expectations of dominance. And the Crown doesn't achieve outright victory in these conflicts, but it does enough to impose its vision of that relationship. And as a result of that, you see you see the consequence of that almost immediately. So the, the Waikato War, 1863, ends in 1864. Within 12 months of that, you get the Native Land Court established, which has been described as an engine of destruction for Māori society. Um, a couple of years later, you get the Native School System established. Um, so one strips Māori of their land, the other of their language. And I think we, we still live with the consequence of that in so many ways today. And I think, you know, as I've argued in my book on the, on the wars, um, you, you can see that in the socioeconomic statistics for Māori communities today as well. So I would argue this is not ancient history. We live, we live with the New Zealand wars every day. Uh, before I go to the next question, I did forget to mention that apparently there have been a few technical issues. It is possible that the actual visual will disappear, but you will still be able to hear our voices. So just to alert you not to be concerned if the, uh, the actual uh, visual disappears, the audio will still be there. So moving to the second question, you're both involved in a Marsden project, Hei Taonga Te Ware Ware, remembering and forgetting difficult histories in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Can you explain how this came about and what the project involves? Well, thank you, um, Susan, and uh, um, thank you, everyone, for um, coming in today. And these are very challenging times that we're in. So thank you for um, the coming and, and sharing this time with us. And Vincent and I, it's our 17th wedding anniversary today. So we're very pleased to be sharing it with such a large group of, of people. But um, Susan, to, to answer your, your question, the, the central idea behind the work that Vincent and I are doing is that what a nation chooses to remember and what it chooses to forget tells us a lot about what kind of nation we are. And that's something that New Zealand has really, really struggled with for a very, very long time. So the study that we're doing, the work we're doing together um, on, on this idea, it had its beginnings in a whole lot of different places. About four years ago, um, Vincent and I uh, were doing a, a small study together, a small collaboration uh, that, that took place just after the um, Otarahanga College petition to Parliament. So that um, petition, it was um, set up in 2015, and the purpose of it, it, it happened after a group of rural King Country school students were taken to battle sites in the Waikato area, and they learned the histories of what was happening in their region. Um, and they were really amazed that so little was known about these stories. Now, that led to a petition being taken 
to Parliament. These young people set up a petition and it, what, it resulted in um, a national day of commemoration for the New Zealand wars. And of course, we've, we've just recently heard uh, the government announcement that a history will be taught, New Zealand history will be taught in schools um, from 2022. Um, so, the petition ignited a really important debate in New Zealand. Um, there were lots of people who were very highly supportive of it. There, are, there were a number of people who were very uncomfortable with it. And what it did was it created a new kind of conversation that we hadn't seen before. And it was a conversation or a debate around, around memory, around identity, around history. And we felt that that, that really deserved um, closer consideration. So that was one of the beginning points for the study that we're doing. The other um, beginning point for us was that um, at that time, Vincent was writing his, I call it his big book, uh, about the Waikato invasion. So that was um, the, the, there we go, uh, great teaching, teaching aid here, Great War for New Zealand. And what we were doing at that time was um, we were driving around different sites in the Waikato King Country that were associated with the invasion of the Waikato. And it was kind of interesting because I'm a sociologist and Vincent is a historian and sociologists and historians have totally different ways of creating knowledge of thinking about the world. And so as we were going around these battle sites, we were having these conversations and um, that, that really sort of sparked our, our interest in, in perhaps um, working together. But the other thing that was really um, dismaying was that we spent a lot of time um, driving around the Waikato King Country looking for where these sites were because a lot of them, you know, really important, significant historical sites weren't signposted. And as, as Vincent has, has said um, previously, um, most commonly in New Zealand, what we do with, with important historical sites is that we tend to drive a road through them. Um, so we did kind of start to wonder what was going on there and you know, why would that was happening. And that led us to, to asking questions about um, who decides what is important to remember about our nation's past and who decides what we memor memorialize, memorialize and also who chooses what we forget or don't talk about, who chooses the silences. So that really got us thinking about the selectiveness of public um, memory and also public uh, forgetting in, in New Zealand and in, in particularly in relation to those very difficult and violent events um, in New Zealand's colonial era. So that was um, specifically the New Zealand wars which ran roughly from around about 1845 through to around about 1872. So what we're doing in this project is um, our goal is to understand how different groups remember, but also how different groups forget um, their his these histories and how those memories are transmitted over time and particularly how those memories change over time. Um, so we want to examine really how those fragmented, often fractured, often highly contested histories are remembered and forgotten. And because we were very inspired by the, the young people of Otarahanga College, we we're particularly interested in how those memories are transmitted um, to young people. So, so that was the, the foundations of the project. And of course, now um, we've, we've had this big announcement that New Zealand history is, is going to be taught um, in, in New Zealand schools. So, so that has been quite a heartening um, experience. Do you have anything to add? So, what I'd like to ask you is, what do you hope to achieve through this project? Is there more to it than just another academic study? Yeah, well, we hope so. We, we don't want to just do that thing of, you know, um, scholars going into Māori communities, they get what they want and then they leave yeah. and that's it. Um, and really, we, we think this is part of a wider sort of national project which is really about healing and reconciliation. Um, mm. We need to find ways as a nation to talk about this history, we, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it hurts. Mm. We need to get beyond that. And I think um, 
talking about that history, raising awareness of it, is, is part of that process of healing. Because for too, lo too long now, Pākehā have not engaged with this history. And that's, that's not healthy. So we, we, we want to be part of that conversation. And obviously, this has become even more topical now, uh, given the decision that we might talk about later to, to teach us in all schools by 2022. So, you know, we see this as part of a much bigger, a much bigger movement that, um, as a nation, we, we all need to engage in this and take ownership of, of our history. I think, Joanne, I just want to ask you, with regard to Māori youth, um, you know, my understanding is they've gone through our national schools and received probably a colonial history. So how important is for them to receive the history of their people and their experience of these things? Mm. That's such a good question, um, Susan. Thank you for asking it. Um, one of the things that, that I think has been really damaging for a lot of Māori children has been that, that these histories and Māori understandings, hapu and iwi understandings of what's happened in the past, haven't been part of the school day. So Māori children are often quite historically literate, for, or particularly those who are living in, in within tribal boundaries, because a lot of them are present at hui, they're present at wānanga, they're pre, they're, you know, when the Waitangi Tribunal rolls into town, they've been present and heard evidence, been given at hearings. So Māori young people uh, are often you know, quite heavily involved in their communities in understanding the past, but there's this, this kind of corresponding silence within schools, and that is a silence which is really deeply damaging because those histories, um, they, we carry them with us today. So when they're not part of the school curriculum, when they're not officially validated in formal contexts like schools, that becomes a source of mamwe, it becomes a source of pain. Um, one of the things that in the work that I've done in previous studies with, with Māori young people has been that um, there is often in schools, there's no language to talk about racism. So Māori young people often perceive when they're at school that something is really badly wrong. But often it's it's kind of structural racism or it's happening a long way below the radar and they just don't have a, a language to, to talk about those, those really important things that are affecting their lives. So the silences around history are equally damaging. Um, because we're not giving young people a language, or we haven't previously given young people a language to understand and explain the lives that, that they're living at the moment, how those are, are going through. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. So you have both been prominent in efforts to push for New Zealand history to be taught in all schools. As you've mentioned, we've had this announcement from the Prime Minister that this is is going to happen in 2022. Can you talk us through some of the challenges with implementing this and what you think needs to happen? Okay, um, I think we'll probably both speak to that, but I think um, it's that's really important because this really goes to the heart of the project that, that we're doing at the moment. Um, our project isn't just about finding out what happened uh, during the wars. Um, our project is also about who decides what we're going to remember and what is not going to be talked about. So the Ministry of Education is, is picking up this. Now, we have to be really clear that during, when the Otarahanga College petition went forward, the Ministry of Education was absolutely vocally and very, very vocally opposed to New Zealand history being taught in schools as part of a national curriculum. And so there, there was almost an entrenched hostility towards that happening. Now we're in a situation where the ministry is having to pick this up. And so discussions are, are beginning, which is a really good thing. But I guess for me as a Māori scholar, um, I, I look at the ministry as an agent of the Crown and I worry about it being selective about who it's speaking with as the, as the curriculum is, is being um, developed. There is no question that hapu and iwi need to be directly involved with the development of the, the new curriculum, not least because the wars affected Māori communities in very different ways. So each community had its own response 
to the uh, colonial era. So what I would suggest is that there is not one history of the wars. There are many histories because it, the impact on um, different communities was, was so radically diverse. And it's really important that young people are able to navigate those multiple stories because they are quite complex. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the challenges. I, I also worry that if the curriculum just simply becomes a narrative of total redemption, so a story of how things were really bad in the past and, and the Crown did do some really yuck stuff, um, but it's okay because, you know, they're not invading Māori communities today and, um, you know, we, you know, we've done cool stuff like set up the Waitangi tribunal and and by the way we also gave women the vote so things were bad then but you know they're okay now if we had that sort of redemptive narrative i think we're doing the the a real disservice to the young people of of new zealand i want um i think probably i'm speaking for both of us but i'll just speak for me i i really want young people in new zealand to understand what's happened in the past i i want them to know what has happened but I also want them to know how it affects what's happening for Māori right now in the present. Uh, so I want them to understand what's happening now in education and health in the criminal justice system um, with Oranga Tamariki. I want young people to be able to make those connections, to see those links that go through from what was happening in the 19th century to, to what's, what's happening now. Um, and I, I want that because what I really want is for informed young people to change the future, the possible future that, that lies ahead of us. And for young people to do that, they really need to be able to engage with the past and to also understand that the past, it seeps in. The past seeps into the, the how we live now. So understanding that um, can be a, a foundation for change. So I think it's important that young people don't just know what happened in the past, but they understand the sticking points. Late last year, Vincent and I were at a, at a conference um, and we were talking to a German historian who talked about how um, the Second World War history is taught in schools and young people are taken to concentration camps and they're told the stories. And, you know, there, there's all sorts of issues and, and, and problems around that with young people kind of tuning out if, if something becomes um, compulsory. But what, what this uh, academic was telling us was that it is really important not just to know what happened, but to be able to identify it so that so that these bad things don't happen again. And I think that's the possibility that we have um, with the history curriculum that's opening up. But I think it's a possibility that will only be realized if hapu and iwi get a chance to tell their own stories, that these become embedded in, in a curriculum that respects the, the places where, where these, where these thing, events took place. Um, <clears throat> Rahui Papa said that young people need to learn the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I agree with that. You know, we need the, we need a what's and all. We we don't want this sort of um, superficial, backslapping, smug approach to our history. You know, greatest race relations in the world, and all that stuff that so many generations of New Zealanders grew up with. Yeah. I think another thing uh, that that um, is really important is, as Joanna said, working with Iwi and Hapu and connecting with mana whenua histories will really empower rangatahi to understand yeah. the communities that they call home. Yeah. I think, why are we doing this? One of the reasons is we need to give people a sense of place and a sense a sense that that place has a history. A and we're walking in the footsteps of ancestors and we're walking in places that have a history and we need to engage with that history. We need to understand it. And so, so for, for that to work, I think, you know, we, we need to avoid kind of a centralised top-down curriculum. It should be place-based. All students in Taranaki should be learning about the Taranaki wars, and they should, of course, visit Parihaka and other sites connected with those wars. They also need to engage with the wider, wider national context as well. They need to know how that fits in with the Waikato war and so on. But, but, but start with that history close to home, um, working, working with iwi to learn that history. And for schools that don't already have those connections with, with local iwi, this is going to be really empowering. 
because suddenly they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they will have those relationships with those communities. And that does mean that e, we need to be resourced to, to do that. You, yeah. We can't just expect people to turn up and do that for free. They need to be resourced um, and supported to provide that. Um, and I think also, it's uh, some people have this idea that, that um, teaching history is sort of a, a teacher standing in front of the class, sort of writing out a list of dates and places and names and so on, and the students memorize them and there's their history lesson. Yeah. For me, I think it, it should be much more about students um, learning about their communities. And there are lots of ways that they could do that. One of the, one of the examples I've um, sort of talked about is um, you, could, you could get students to, to walk around their neighborhood and look at the, look at the names of the streets and find out what, who are those streets named after? Mm. And do they, do they think of Lontemsky Street as still appropriate today? And so, you know, that, that kind of, that's a real way that young people can engage with their own community, or they could be going to their, their nearest cemetery and, and finding people there with connections with the New Zealand wars. I mean, there are lots of ways you, you could be engaging with this history as well. And it doesn't just, it doesn't just need to be confined to the history curriculum. I mean, an, an English student should be engaging with witty Yamada's works and so on. There are lots and lots of ways that um, people can engage with this history. I think the other really important aspect of this as well is that um, teachers need to be provided with the professional learning and development support for this because what we're trying to do here is really um, break this intergenerational cycle of ignorance around our history. And a lot of teachers um, didn't learn any of this, this, this stuff at school themselves. So they, they need to be provided with the support mm to be able to teach this history properly as well. I think that's really important. Mm. There actually is a question that comes in that follows on from what you've been saying. Um, I've read it out, it's from Sin Kawana. The discussion on Maori history is an excellent move. My concern is ensuring the history taught is hapu and iwi, as it is very different across the motu, and you've stressed that. How realistic do you think this will happen given the movement of teachers in New Zealand? Any thoughts? Well, wow. um, we have a window of opportunity. We have, there is a short period of time before um, the goals of this curriculum are put together. Uh, it, and we know already that hapu and iwi around the country are actually mobilising. They're already creating these, these resources. Mm. So um, Māori communities have been incredibly proactive in this. I really hope that the ministry recognises and engages um, with that as, as widely as possible. One of the things that, that we, that Māori are really good at is, you know, if, if uh, someone from the Crown turns up and asks a question, Māori communities have all sorts of systems in place to respond very quickly from a very wide range of people. I mean, that's what we are about. We are an environment where, at the moment, with, with COVID-19, where, where that is going to be somewhat curtailed. But there are the, the protocols within Māori communities themselves to, to generate these, these resources and understandings. But the window of opportunity is only a small one. So it is down to the ministry to um, enact its role as a partner with Māori. Do you have anything to add? I think that, I think that the, mo the most important thing is that teachers um, accept the need for engaging with iwi and hapu in their communities. Yeah. And once there's that willingness, um, you know, the, the rest of it is a matter of working out the details. Mm -hmm. And for, I mean, a lot of teachers, I mean, I've often spoken about when I was at school, I didn't learn any New Zealand history. And I asked my teacher one day about this and said, well, Sir, why aren't we learning any New Zealand history? And he said, Forget it, forget it, lad, it's boring. Nothing happened here, move on. So we can't we the first the the first thing we need to do is is break down those attitudes. Um and there was a, I mean there was a lovely ending to that because a couple of years ago I was speaking at the New Zealand History Teachers Association co conference in Waikato, and um I, I talked about the New Zealand Wars and, and somebody came up to me afterwards and he said, Hello, do you remember me? And I was like, oh, my God. He said, Hi, I'm your old history teacher. And, and he said, you know, look, you, and I used that anecdote in my talk because he was the last person I expected to be at a, at a conference for uh, teachers who are interested in his own history. And he said, you're quite right, Vincent. I did say that. And, you know, I, I see his own history as boring. But he explained to me years later, he moved to an area where most of the, the students at the school were Māori. And he thought, why am I teaching Tudor and Stuart history to a room full of Māori students when they've got so much history all around them. So he, um, 
he took the time to go off and learn New Zealand history for the first time himself, and he was kind of blown away, which was my reaction when I was first exposed to it as well, years later. So, I mean, that was really heartening. That's, that's, that's the first thing we need to do, is break down those ingrained attitudes and prejudices against our own history. Mm. Uh, also, there's another question that's come here that relates, it says, Kira, as the government is planning the country's history to be taught in the schools, my question is, who is setting up the New Zealand history or setting up the syllabus to be taught? Have you any knowledge of that or? Um, well, uh, the, the Ministry of Education are, are, are planning the sort of high level curriculum documents, um, which hopefully won't be too prescriptive in that they will provide um, schools and local areas with the opportunity to think about how they engage with that history at a local level. Um, and I think, I mean, the government's announcement is pretty ambitious when you think about this being in place by 2022. Mm. There's lots and lots of thing, things that need to happen before then, um, you know, with teachers being upskilled, um, establishing those relationships with iwi and hapu, um, writing and, and distributing resources and, and teaching websites and apps and whatever else you need to support the, the teaching of this history. So there's a lot of work uh, involved before we before we get to 2022. Thank you. So I'll move on to the next question here. How else could we remember and acknowledge this history? So it's a fairly open question, but thinking of what you've said already, how else could we better remember and acknowledge this history? One of the um, ways that that I think there are a number of ways um, that this could happen. One of the ways that, that we both feel very strongly about is that the sites um, need to be looked after. A lot of the, the New Zealand Wars battle sites or sites of memory commemoration site of Wahi Tapu are, are really difficult to find. So I'm talking about sites of, of national significance here. So look after the sites, clean them up, um, signpost them so that people can find them. We spent have spent many hours wandering up and down rural roads looking for, for battle sites, um, and it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, look after the sites. Um, I think also um, people need to take ownership of this history, and we need to say that this is part of our story, and we're mature enough as a nation to own that. And that's not about making anybody feel guilty or ashamed about the actions of their ancestors. It's just been grown up as a nation about our history and saying we can't be selective. You know, we, we, we rally around the flag on Anzac Day because that's seen as a source of patriotic pride and so on. But this other history, the history of the wars fought here, makes people feel uncomfortable. And Pākehā have lost the ways to talk about this history. So we need to find ways to talk about this history again as part of, as part of this process of healing. And I think one of the things that will happen once this is taught in all schools by 2022 is you'll have young people educating their parents and their grandparents about this history. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we also need to provide resources for adults to engage with this history as well, mm -hmm. whether that's books or websites or apps or, um, you know, there are loads of things. There are, yeah. there are loads of ways in which you could, you could um, share this history. And we need to sort of be creative about that. You know, it would be wonderful to see uh, some some New Zealand dramas on TV about you know some of the incredible figures from this history like Wurumu Tamihara or mm. Rabbi Maniapoto or Hene Te, te, um, te Kiri, um, uh, Jane Foley and, yeah, and yeah. lots of others. I mean it's just um, th there's so many inspirational figures from this history and um, people would you know people who have been exposed to this history. Um, my experience is when they, when they do get it, they're blown away by it and they ask themselves, why didn't I learn about this at school? Well, one of the things that, that we've certainly found since we've been doing this study in the past year, the extraordinary generosity of people around the country who have come to us, people who you know, may otherwise have been sort of stereotyped as being kind of a bit but conservative and, and not really into that kind of stuff. We have been overwhelmed by the number of older New Zealanders who have come to us and said, look, we didn't know these histories, but we know that we had this, we're descended from this person who we think may have been a soldier during the wars, we're not too sure. And so they want to share those stories. We've had people come 
come forward with stories from their whānau, they've come forward with artefacts. There's just this huge generosity that we've been shown because people really do want these stories to be told. And I think it is about um, finding ways of developing a sense of place and a sense of place belonging. People know that there have been these silences, and in those silences, a sense of disconnection has grown. And so for, for Māori, it's it's a sense of ukaipu, it's our sense of connection with whenua, with our history, with our tūpuna. And I think it is also that, in in a way, with, with Pākehā as well, making those those connections with their own histories, their own with their own ancestors, and being able to um, tell those stories with, with confidence. Just been looking at some of the chat that's come in. Um, one person's making the point that many hapu and iwi are involved in the film and media industry. This could be used as people already involved in acting and representation of stories. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. Absolutely. Um, I mean, wouldn't it be incredible if Peter Jackson made a blockbuster about Araka? You've got this this sort of fantasy history in the Waikato, you know, Middle Earth, Hobbiton and so on. And there's real history that took place right there that we're kind of ignoring as a nation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, another question is, says, alongside the development of curriculum, we need to consider the way that it is delivered. Are we resisting the recolonization of narratives yes. from iwi and hapu? Um, and the person uses a term I haven't met before, open head and insert knowledge type teaching. But I think that are we resisting the recolonization? Mm. I think um, I think this is actually a really important point, and and thank you um, for for making it. Th this is always the risk, and I think if we fall into the trap, or if the ministry falls into the trap of having these kind of redemptive narratives um, around the curriculum, where it was all rubbish and now it's all lovely. Um, then I think this does risk recolonization. I think it does risk creating new kinds of silences in schools. And that is the offshoot from that will be that it becomes harmful. It becomes particularly harmful for Māori, but it becomes harmful for, for everyone. So I think um, I think that is very definitely a, an important um, point that needs, needs to be made and taken into consideration. I also think um, that one of the things that concerns me as well is that often there are really good intentions, like people really do want to do the right thing. But if hapu and iwi are taken away from the centre centra of those conversations, then good intentions can become a bit destructive. And I say that in a respectful way, but good intentions um, can be as messy as... Uh, malevolence hmm. yeah so there's a question here another one it says laura o'connell rapira has mentioned that focusing on the new zealand wars can be triggering for some maori i have also seen some pakeha students distressed when faced with histories of colonialism how can we make learning new zealand history an empowering experience for students of all backgrounds Look, that's another really good good question. Um, some of the histories that we're dealing with are extraordinarily triggering because they are extraordinarily violent. Um, I find um, one of the things that Vincent and I, I are doing is we, we move around the country to different battle sites. And as a Māori woman, I feel particularly triggered by going to Orako, because I know that I, I there are tupuna there. Um, so that is a really difficult place um, for me to be. It is really difficult uh, for me. Again, I'm speaking as a Māori woman and Māori academic, knowing that, that um, the war that Māori women fought was very different from, from the war um, that, that others fought during that time. So um, talking about the violence, it is real and it is hyper violence. And for a very long time, um, these stories weren't told because 
there was a fear for Māori whānau didn't want to traumatise their children. They didn't want them to carry that pain. And so there were silences that, that grew around that, that hyper-violence that was exercised at that time. And so, you know, the, the tendency, I think, is often to go towards the lovely knowledge that, okay, it was really nasty, but it's okay now. I think what we need to do if we're looking at building a school, building a curriculum around these issues, is to find ways of telling those stories that um, is going to be age appropriate. Again, I think it is really important that hapu and iwi are involved because hapu and iwi have carried this knowledge on their own for a very long time. They've found ways of dealing with, with the trauma. Um, and so a very well place to be advising uh, around that. Would, would you agree? Mm. Mm. So this is in the comments box, but it, it is interesting too. Um, I think it is very important that this history is taught to adults also. I would like to know more. I do not want to wait until children grow up to have to enough awareness among the masses to promote the constitutional change that I believe will come. Pākehā Tauiwi are no longer, so that once Pākehā Tauiwi are no longer ignorant of the history of this land. Yeah, no, I agree. And um, here's another prop. Here's, here's another, I'm not, not advertising, but here's, I wrote this as a short book um, on the New Zealand War. So it's an introduction and it's partly for senior students, years 11 to 13, but also for adults who didn't engage with the history at all in, in their schooling years. So it's not overly academic. And I mean, obviously that, that's not the last word on it. We need more resources. Um, and um, as I said, you know, websites, apps and so on. Recently, when we were in Northland, I had this, this um, idea that wouldn't it be great if you had an app that told you that an historical site was coming up in say one kilometers time, it gave you a, a, a little summary about what was there, so on, so that you could make a decision about whether you wanted to stop there. I mean, at the moment, there are, there are a few apps for different things. There's one for the Waikato War. There's another one in Taranaki. There are a couple of things in Northland, but there's not a single app for the whole country that mm. just told you historical site coming up. Do you want to stop at it? Mm. Because so many of us are oblivious to this history that's all around us. We need to engage with our landscape, engage with the whenua, and we need the resources so that we're aware of what's there. I mean, you know, as Joanna said before, so many people would just drive through Odako every day and, and not even be aware that the most famous battle in New Zealand history took place right there. And they're driving through that path side. So, you know, we just need to have those um, resources um, available for people so that they can engage with this history. And it is about, um, you know, ensuring that it's not just young people, but adults as well need to, to engage with this history and to take ownership of it. Mm. This is, a, this is another question. The person said that I learned about Te Tiriti or Waitangi. It was a light bulb moment for me. Um, I hope that with the history being taught at school, the subject at tertiary level could be more complex. For example, looking at Te Tiriti or Waitangi alongside the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. So that thing of starting from our country, but moving out to seeing it in international perspective. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think so. I, I think we need to um, position the New Zealand wars as a wider history of British imperialism. And, you know, for example, a large number of the troops who came to New Zealand in the 1860s came from India. They were involved in what used to be called the Indian Mutiny and is now called the First Indian War of Independence. And after New Zealand, they went off to, to Canada or elsewhere. So there's a wider history here, a wider sequence of imperialism. And I mean, one aspect of this that I'm really interested in is um, I mentioned earlier that there were 18,000 British troops who came out here, but actually about uh, two thirds of the rank and file uh, soldiers were actually Irish, which is, you know, Britain's original colony, basically. Yeah. It's the original imperial outpost. So, you know, thinking about how did those people um, feel about doing to Māori what had been done to their own country? you know, where their lands have been confiscated wave after wave of invasion and so on. Did they feel empathy for Māori? Did they, did they see those parallels? And I think that's really interesting and it does open up opportunities for a transnational approach to this history, which I agree is, is uh, entirely appropriate to do at tertiary level. Um, when you start 
positioning this history in the, in the wider um, context of British imperialism. Um, this is a broad question. How do we safely engage in teaching the history of New Zealand land wars, etc.? Any points about safety? I think you've touched on them, but anything more there? I think one of the things that I would like to say, one of the things that has come up a number of times as, as we've been doing the study, and I just have to give a shout out for um, our postdoctoral research fellow, um, Leanna McDonald, who is giving um, a talk in, in this series. Please attend it if you can. She's been um, very interested in what's been happening in the um, emotional dimensions of, of these histories. One thing that I would like to say, and this is after many conversations with this very extraordinary, extraordinary postdoctoral fellow, discomfort is going to be there. It is going to be difficult. That's why they call, we call them difficult histories. There are parts that people are going to feel horrified and they are going to feel challenged by what they hear. Hearing those stories for the first time, um, it, it can create harm. Um, it can create a sense of guilt or shame or, or embarrassment. And as Vincent has said, that is not the purpose. What I will suggest is that people don't die from a moment's discomfort. Mm. People do die from ongoing structural racism. And that's what we want to address. So it is about finding age appropriate ways so that, that children and young people are safe as they're hearing these stories. But we can't remove all of the hard bits from these very, very violent histories. So we need to find ways of doing it, um, knowing that there is going to be some upset. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, we, we have to think about these issues as well for our project because you know, when we're visiting sites, it's, it's traumatic and it's distressing for people, especially if they haven't been to those places before and they, they weren't previously aware of that history. And, and we've had some sort of incidents at sites like Araka and so on, which have been quite unnerving. And so we, we realised that we really had to look out for each other yeah. and ensure that people were okay. Yeah. And because it is, it, is, um, it is traumatic, it is troubling, and we need to you know, we need to find ways of talking about it that, that uh, is going to ensure that people remain safe. Mm, thank you. Well, this is coming back to a slightly different point. It says, you've raised the point about being aware that the Ministry of Education is an entity of the Crown. Do you believe that our ministries need to be deconstructed so that they actually reflect the principles of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, or do you believe communicating with Iwi and Hapu will be enough? to include a Māori perspective in governmental decisions? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I'll just speak from my perspective, and then Vincent may, may have something to add. Um, from my perspective, I think that, that um, ministries don't need to be deconstructed, but they also need to be decolonised. Because if we are going to have a partnership, if there is going to be a treaty partnership, then there has to be a treaty partnership. Uh, Māori cannot be, in the words of um, Dominic O'Sullivan, the junior partner, um, which has been um, the case. We're there when, when uh, we're needed, but uh, the rest of the time Māori are, are not involved. So I think there is some decolonising that needs, needs to take place um, structurally. And it's, it's events like this one where these conversations that open up spaces for these conversations to take place and this is where you know i find it so heartening to see that there are so many people that are engaging with this particular event have you got anything to add to that um a person has got a question is knowing the history enough or is the fucker papa to the history that makes you safe to deliver it Ooh, that's a great <laughs> That's a terrific question. I would suggest that it's not enough just to know what happened, because if you know what happened, you can feel sad, and then you can move on from it. I think it is important to know the whakapapa. I think it is important to be able to connect those really big histories, the what happened of history, to the bigger thinking around it, and also to the other causes. One of the things that has been really interesting about the study for me 
as Vincent and I have been moving with our team around the country. So I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist, so I look at how people engage with, with these, these events. One of the things that's come up, I started off looking at where does these, where, where's the beginning point of these histories? And quite often what we do is we say, well, the treaty is the beginning point for these histories. But actually what I've discovered, which is disconcerting for me as a sociologist, is that these histories have their beginnings and their origins in many places in many, many different places, which is why, as I said earlier, there are so many different stories, so many different tribal narratives about what happened um, with the war. So I think, I think having, having that, um, that foundation of knowledge around it does, that whakapapa does, does make things more safe. Yeah, I think also having the relationships with, with the iwi and the hapu in those communities. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in a fortunate position where a lot of my research has been working for those iwi and hapu on their treaty claims, um, which was, you know, how I've come to, to publish a lot of my works is through that history and through, you know, th those groups expressing a real eagerness for that history to be shared with the wider community. So a thought that came to me was when we talk about a relationship based on te treaty, you can think about it in the national sense, but do you think there is a sense in which it needs to be understood very much locally? I, I would suggest that that is absolutely the case. Um, that, uh, as I said earlier, the wars had a different impact on different communities. So, um, I think I think localizing that it always does need to be connected to the bigger picture because it's not just a local story. There are many many local stories. So, and this is something you've been arguing for as yeah, well. Yeah. Well, the the other aspect of it as well is I, I would like to see. I mean, once you accept that this is important, there are lots of ways you could think about this. I mean, for example, Taranaki Anniversary Day. What does that even mark? Does anybody actually know? I don't. Um, but. Would Parihaka Day, the 5th of November, maybe that's a more appropriate day to mark as a provincial anniversary in the Taranaki province. And there are lots and lots of examples of that around the country. I mean, obviously the selection of the actual date itself would be a discussion, a dialogue that would need to happen with like Iwi and Hapu. But we kind of need to think about um, ways to raise awareness of this history, not just at the national level, uh, but also locally as well. And obviously at the national level, the Ramo Mahara, the 28th of October, is an important day to to think about this, the wider history, um, but there are, there are other opportunities to do this locally as well. And I think that's really important. We need to connect people with their own community and what happened there and to, to share this idea that, that that whenua has a history and we need to engage with it. Thank you. Now there's another question that's here. Uh, following on previous questions, a lot of new immigrants and naturalised citizens don't know much about Aotearoa's history, and those who do are usually consuming mainstream Pākehā narratives. So it's a concern about educating adults, but particularly those who are new migrants to our country. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, um, you know, the, when we think about that, there are practical things that we could do, like um, ensure that these histories are translated into a range of languages so that it's accessible to a wider range of people. Um, maybe an introduction to this history is, is, is part of the process of citizenship. I, I don't know, but there are, there are lots of ways to ensure that people engage with this history. And I think, another, you know, we often talk about Māori and Pākehā, but another useful way to think about this is, is tangata whenua and tangata tiriti, the people of the treaty, and, and, and all tauiwi are tangata tiriti. And um, so framing it in that way, you know, makes for a more inclusive discussion around this history that, that people can relate to, I think, as well. So that theme has come up again about, well, a number of people have commented that they've really appreciated your uh, point that people won't die from a moment of discomfort. <laughs> but uh, there is this... Uh, from some people, this ongoing concern. As a Māori, it's hard to trust the Crown through the Ministry of Education to deliver a curriculum that takes into consideration whānau hapu perspectives. My hapu, Ngāti Hika, was obliterated as a consequence of the siege of Wairenga Ahika, 
many of our tipuna, tipuna were taken to Farakori mm -hmm. without trial. How do we ensure that our children are nurtured through the process? Well, um, we've, we've visited Wairanga Hika with, with one of the, the leading kaumata up there, Wairangi Pera, and um, you know, what happened in that district was absolutely appalling. Um, I, I, I used that as an example in, in my most recent book, talking about the casualty rates in the wars. And in World War I, the casualty rate as, as a percentage of the New Zealand population was 1.8%, and that was considered the greatest bloodbath in New Zealand history. But I calculated that in the Tūdanga or Gisborne district, uh, where the Wairang Hika battle took place, in the space of four years, one in five Māori died, um, which is, you know, so more than 10 times, easily more than 10 times the rate of World War One, And so that, that's just an incredible um, level of loss. Um, and a lot of people in that Gisborne community, a lot of Pākehā, wouldn't be aware of that history. So. There, there are, there are, you know, there are lots of opportunities to ensure that people engage with that history, not directed by the Ministry of Education. I mean, the, the curriculum is really just setting a framework, and it's up to schools to work with iwi and hapu as to how they deliver that. So, one of the one of the things with the current uh, curriculum system is it provides for a high level of autonomy, and I think we still want to see some, you know. The, the curriculum provides a framework, but 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 schools have a lot of choice within that about how they go about delivering that that um, content, and that's where it's really important that they establish those relationships with iwi and hapu, and um, ensure that it's done in a, in a proper way. And I think I think too that uh, again, you know, if we don't have a language for racism in schools, which in in many schools there isn't, so so children and young people can't talk about what's happening to them. There isn't a language for us to have these conversations about these acts of monumental violence. And these, um, the harm which has been done, it's carried in the present by Māori. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are new conversations that have to take place. I'm not sure, personally, I'm not sure if the ministry is, is well positioned to um, have those conversations just yet because there are still so many silences that, that frame the school day. Um, and again, um, I just have to give another plug for our research fellow, Liana McDonald, who will be talking about some of these silences in, in the education system as part of this series. Well, thank you both. Our time is coming to an end. So I want to thank both of you, especially, it's just been wonderful hearing from you both. Thank you for all of you who've listened in. And those of you that have sent comments, I'm afraid I haven't been able to pick up on them all, but I'm sure you feel very satisfied by the responses that you've had. Uh, I'm also asked to thank our partners, uh, particularly um, our moderator and tech for this session and the community research for the webinar support. Um, just to be aware that uh, the project has got a Facebook that you can go to. Um, we're asking you to carry this forward. The things that have been said here, all of us have got spheres of influence where we can um, use that to ensure what uh, Vincent and Joanna are working on is carried forward. Um, I think as just in conclusion, I'd like to ask a special blessing on Vincent and Joanna on their wedding anniversary, but especially <laughs> on the work that you are doing. It is, I've just found it so uplifting, and I'm sure all of us had. So um, every best wish to you and to all of us. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh...